Since the dawn of man, I have been a stout follower of the Outlast horror games. Take a look. A series which has been displayed multiple times on my own channel back in the day, for better or worse. Oh, this is nostalgia right here. Uh, let's go into chapters. Here we are, once again, back in the back in the sewer. Oh! Ew! Dude! What the? F I have followed this franchise's progress and lore religiously, all the way up until their newest release, The Outlast Trials. A game, even though being a prequel which takes place 50 years before the first two, confirms and sheds even more light on the plotlines that occur in the first two, especially in the second one, Outlast 2. The game that this video is to be centered around, focusing on the underlying plotline of the game, and what's been written between the lines of the game's story, primarily the inner struggles of its protagonist, and how meaningless the whole plot turns out to be in the end, as some people may have realized near the story's climax. And I've put underlying an asterisk because this is now a seven-year-old game. Just a heads up that this isn't some revolutionary idea which has never been said before, but I have seen several people play through this game without having a single clue as to what was going on 90% of the time. I'm just a bit delayed to explain it. About seven years too late, but you know. In this video, we will find out that Outlast 2 is a story of tragedy, travesty, guilt, and how that can come back to haunt you in the future. Now, as much as I want to talk about Outlast 2 and why it's the horror game you never understood, I have to quickly talk about the first one beforehand, and how it sets up expectations for the sequel. The original Outlast, released in late 2013, were instant hits within the horror game industry, and gained massive amounts of popularity through the YouTube horror scene due to its fast-paced sequences, a surface-level storyline that could sorta go with the gameplay, and numerous amounts of cheesy jump scares. <laughs> Okay, okay, that one was actually good. Perfect for 2013 YouTube. Oh, Story beats were primarily outright told to the player through scenes happening in the game, but still kept it fairly simple enough for anyone to understand what was going on. I'm sure the majority of people could understand that you were inside an insane asylum where they had done unimaginable experiments on the patients, which then had turned them crazy, and then your goal was to get the f*** out of there. This was the first ever introduction to the lore and its events, so it makes sense to keep it sort of straightforward. Red Barrels, the developers of the game, managed to create a surface level plot which could be understood well enough to the degree that most players were satisfied but also provided the opportunity for people looking to delve deeper into the lore by adding in the various documents which you can find around the game. Reading these would give the player further insight as to what secrets Mount Massive Asylum and their benefactors, the illustrious and dangerous Murkoff Corporation, really had withheld from public eyes. With that being said, having read the documents or not, the lore can be understood by the normal player by using a mix of both showing and telling. This is especially seen with the two large exposition dumps both being told by Dr. Wernicke, who was one of the lead scientists handling the morphogenic engine program near the end of the game, and the plot being even further established in some of the DLC sequences. In 2017, four years after the first game's initial release, the sequel, Outlast 2, came out. The general audience seemed to enjoy it, the scares were disturbing, the game once again looked incredible for an indie studio to accomplish, the amazing score by Samuel Laflamme returned. The stressing chase sequences also made their return. Perhaps a little too many of those. Oh my goodness! But something felt missing, and I don't know if it was just my 13 year old self being narrow minded, but Outlast 2 was an entirely different game from what I had expected it to be. I remember vividly that I thought the game was bad because it didn't reintroduce any of the characters from the original games, but you know. And for many years after finding out that to understand the story, plot, and themes of Outlast 2, you have to read the documents throughout the game, it threw me off. So basically, my mindset was. I have to read miserable and totally optional papers throughout the game to understand the plot fully? This game sucks! 
Now, take that as you will, you may agree or not, but I still feel like that argument holds up to an extent. I mean, look at this. It's like a whole fucking novel. Perhaps it was the sudden change in setting or new characters, but I feel like the game lacked a cohesive storyline. This was at least what I and many others thought after finishing the game, not understanding what on earth had just happened. And to an extent, I believe that that was actually the point. And that's what differs from the original Outlast and its sequel. That's why the inclusion of Dr. Wernicke was added in the first one to make it all make sense. This instance doesn't occur in Outlast 2. Blake Langerman is a completely unreliable source, but as he serves as the game's protagonist, some people might draw conclusions that what Blake experiences through his time in Temple Gate to be completely factual when that isn't the case at all. From what I see, it, there are two different perspectives to it. We have Blake Langerman's slash the player's perspective, which is the more simple approach where the plot is hidden and all questions are left unanswered, and the other perspective being the overarching plotline of the conflict with the Murkoff Corporation, realizing how insignificant Blake's point of view actually is. Most people didn't quite understand or catch Red Barrels' attempt to create this unique way of storytelling, and thus finishing the game both confused and probably also quite unsatisfied with the ending. We'll get to that one. I certainly remember being as befuddled as your average TikTok brain rot enjoyer after finishing it. But now, seven years later, having played through the game several times, read the graphic novel The Murkoff Account, and now also with the inclusion of The Outlast Trials, I think that this is an incredible story, and ending for that matter. The thing is, Outlast 2 tries to combine a brooding, slow-burning, psychological horror, elaborate plotline with the gameplay reminiscent of Outlast 1, but cranked up to 11 and then some. Essentially, if you don't give a fuck about storylines and just play these games for the scares, they're both perfect for you. Although I still can't decide whether letting a psychological horror game's main way of letting the player know what's going on reside in optional notes sometimes very well hidden away from the game's otherwise linear progression style. The events of Outlast 2 happen shortly after the Mount Massive incident. In the game's opening hours, you are introduced to investigative journalist Lynn Langerman, along with her husband and cameraman Blake Langerman. The pair are currently in the midst of Arizona, following a supposed murder case of an unidentified 8-month-old pregnant woman. They've already delved deep into the desert, traveling by helicopter due to the impossible environment. As they're flying over the area, a sudden white blinding light followed by what sounds like a deep ominous hum surprises the pair and completely disables the helicopter engine, leading them to crash down into the unknown territory. When Blake regains consciousness, he finds that he's mysteriously awoken inside a somewhat familiar-looking school. This being the old Catholic school, St. Sybil, which he attended as a child, further established by the photos of him and his classmates in one of the lockers. As he walks down the hall, he then spots a man quickly walking away from him. With nowhere else to go, Blake is forced to follow along through the hall, when suddenly the doors that the man went through close shut right in front of Blake. He then hears a soft humming behind him. Blake quickly turns around to verify the source of the sound, now standing face to face with a young girl in what appears to be a Catholic stylized uniform, very much like his own. Blake identifies this mysterious girl as his childhood friend, Jessica Gray, who had supposedly hanged herself back when they were kids. He even mentioned this to Lynn before they crashed. I was dreaming about Jessica Gray from when we were kids. Oh yeah. I I haven't thought about her in ages. Showing that he still thinks or regrets that part of his past, even though it's been decades since. Before Blake gets any more time to think, a wave of blood comes rushing down the corridor. Very scary. Blake now wakes up for the second time. However, this time it appears to be connected to the events that had happened beforehand. By some miracle, he had survived the helicopter crash. And as he frees himself from the charred metallic parts, he quickly noticed that there were no bodies inside the broken and now burning helicopter. It was pitch black, so the only light emanating on the ground was from the flames of the helicopter and the digital green light from his trusty night vision camera. As mentioned before, they had been dropped in the middle of nowhere, miles from any civilization, 
or so Blake thought. Because as he continues down the rocky paths of the canyon, he spots what would have been the pilot. His skin flayed, strung to a tree. Blake wasn't alone after all. As it turns out, you and your wife have been placed in the middle of this sort of civil war-esque battle between two batshit insane factions. The Christians of Templegate, which is what their town is called, led by the Baron Harkonnen himself, Sullivan Noth, also known as the modern Ezekiel, or the spitten image of every Discord moderator, and then there are the heretics who reside in the mines deep below ground, led by a former servant of Noth named Val, who suddenly decided to go against him and his beliefs after an epiphany of sorts. Obviously, their values conflict with each other. Noth and his Christians want to prevent the birth of the Antichrist, which apparently seems to reside within every woman that gets pregnant, and Val and the heretics, you guessed it, want the Antichrist to be born, to spite God in some rebellious way. You know how they are, heretics, you yeah. You soon find out that Lynn has been kidnapped by the Christians, but eventually end up escaping from them quickly after, where it is revealed that Lynn apparently also is pregnant all of a sudden, as little sense as that makes to you at this point. He has a Blake himself is also super confused by this, because as he confirms later on, this little escapade is short lived, however, as the two are quickly ambushed by the heretics, where they now kidnap Lynn and Blake is left alone once again to fend off for himself. For the rest of the game, you run and hide past whatever evil is in the way. A nasty crucifixion and one live burial later, you make your way to the mines to save your wife once again. Traversing through the mines, avoiding both Val and the heretics, Blake finds Lynn, having been strung up by the heretics in a ceremonial way, awaiting the birth of the child, as she now appears super pregnant, even though it only seems like a day has passed. The pair flee from the mines and manage to end up back in Temple Gate by a chapel to seek refuge from the storm. For reasons unbeknownst to Blake and the player, the world also appears to be destroying itself, with thunderstorms and flames surrounding them, almost like an apocalypse, as if God himself is punishing them. Here, Lin finally gives birth, but when finished, utters the words, as she dies immediately after. Jesus God. Lynn! 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 Blake, now on the brink of insanity, zones out only to wake up soon after to see Solomon Noth sitting in front of him. He tells Blake that God has gone silent since the birth of the baby, only to game end himself with a knife. Blake, without even commenting on the situation, walks out of the chapel, baby in hand. To see that all the people of Templegate have also game-ended themselves, he continues down the path toward the glowing sun that only seems to grow bigger and bigger. When he gets close enough, the sun seemingly explodes, emanating a white, blinding light. When he opens his eyes, he is once again back in his old Catholic school. He hears a familiar voice. <laughs> Try to find me. <laughs> that being Jessica's. I'm over here. This way, Blake. <laughs> As he follows her into the room behind the cafeteria, Blake takes her hand and she tells him, I'll never let you. They both kneel on the cold tile floor and in unison begin praying for seemingly all eternity. Send me quietly to sleep. Watchful Savior, wash away all I've been wrong today. Help me every day to be gentle, gentle, more like thee. So that's pretty much an overview of what happens in the main game through the eyes of the protagonist. Now, these white blinding lights which I mentioned don't only happen in those two occasions, they actually happen quite frequently throughout the game. 
These bright flashes of light, as one can find out by reading one of the very hidden documents in the game, are radio towers. Towers which Blake actually sees at some point in the game, but isn't established on further. At least not directly. In this hidden document, we get told this. At halfway point between the towers and the subjects, and the signal remained strong. Safe to say any damage the electrical storm caused the relays was minimal. I'm going to hike a mile or so closer to the site tomorrow and take some more readings. Had a curious anomaly in the signal strength in the last quarter mile. It actually got stronger as I traveled further from the towers and closer to the site. Could be an effect of microwave parallax, but there is a more exciting option. It could be the mysterious feedback loop. The perceived self-inflicted discomfort and mass capitulation enabling the driven believers into becomes projectors. Essentially, there's a secret facility hidden deep in the mountains, away from Temple Gate with these so-called radio towers being projected toward the town area, with the intent of using the site as a mind control experiment with these powerful electromagnetic radio frequencies. And there's only one entity in this universe that we know who strives to experiment on people by using methods of mind control. The Murkoff Corporation. Very subtle. Also, side note, it turns out that the facility in which the Outlast Trials take place is actually the same facility that has the radio towers and the one that Blake spots the distance. It's apparently called the Sinyala facility, presumably named after the real Mount Sinyala in Arizona, so that's pretty crazy. Another thing that I found pretty cool, and another factor as to how the games are tied together, happened after I had played Outlast Trials, and then recently played through Outlast 2 again. If we take a look at some of Noth's Gospels, we can find a recurring word in many of them. The Spider-Eyed Lamb, which Noth calls it. And now if we switch over to the Outlast Trials, what were the three words that Murkov used to condition their subjects? This confirms that it would be the same type of mind control experiments used on the people of Temple Gate as they had used on subjects in the facility back in 1959, although most likely incredibly more advanced. In the Outlast Trials, we also see the same white blinding light and sound. The only thing I find confusing is as to why Murkoff would do this. The reasoning behind these mind control experiments in the Outlast Trials were of course to create these sleep reagents that could be sent out to areas of conflict, like Cuba, Vietnam. It did take place in the Cold War period after all, but in 2013? Perhaps they were just testing the effects of how it would work in a secluded community instead of a singular individual. And from playing Outlast 2, we can see exactly how that worked out. With each flash that Blake experiences, he hallucinates about his old Catholic school. A place we know that he feels deep regret and guilt about from pretty much the start of the game, even before the influence of the radio towers. As when we boot up the game, we can hear Jessica's voice calling out to him in a dream before being awoken by Lynn in the helicopter. It seems like exposure to the radio frequencies have little to no effect in the beginning, as Blake is hit several times with the light in the opening hours without anything ever happening to him. However, long-term exposure causes individuals to experience these hallucinatory events unique to the person being affected. For example, when the people of Temple Gate are hit with the light during an encounter with them, and later on something that we see happen with Blake's psyche as well. The hallucinations that subjects would experience are related to their past traumas and desires. In Blake's case, the guilt of not being able to save Jessica causes him to relive these events in a twisted version of his school over and over again. Prolonged exposure to the frequencies are also prone to a declining mental health and a change in behavior. 
plus of course the inclusion of more drastic hallucinations, not only in the dreamlike state like the school, but also in reality, as we begin to see more and more unlikely things happening in front of Blake, like the locust storm, the blood rain, and of course, Jessica appearing in front of Blake in the real world. Now is probably also as good as time as any to talk about Blake being a vocal protagonist. Unlike Miles and Waylon from the original, who never said anything, Blake is usually quite expressive with what he thinks. From what I know, most people had an issue with Blake speaking. Fuck! Oh shit! Oh fuck me! Oh shit. Fuck you! What the hell? What the fuck is this? What the fuck? What the fuck? Fuck! Oh, are you crazy? Crazy motherfucker! Through the game, he's constantly just spewing out swears and nonsense that I'm sure the player themselves would either be thinking or saying out loud. They could have gladly cut most of these out in my opinion. But it's when viewing the recordings on your camera that the quality of Blake being a vocal protagonist shines through. Basically, after recording a specific event with your camera, you can review the footage afterwards as Blake then shares a little extra information about the situation. She wasn't there. Lim's body wasn't in the wreckage. She could still be alive. At least that's the gist for the first couple of recordings. The longer we progress throughout the game and record things, we as the player can slowly begin to hear Blake's sanity deteriorate and get worse, sometimes not being able to know reality from hallucinations. She hanged herself before I could stop her. Or she didn't. No. Wait, not her. He. <sighs> Fuck. Going to heaven. God. Before they killed the children. You should have loved me. I... What am I doing? And how his brain is completely scrambled, ultimately taking over his psyche by the end of the game as his mind completely submits to the frequencies. Raining blood, dripping off her shoes, I think. No, just, I try not to step in the blood because I didn't want to leave tracks. Loving and hating God is the same thing. Like making and killing children is the same thing. She told me to meet her in the music room. We're out. I got Jessica out. It was cold, but the snow had just started. We'll find a grown up and we'll tell them what happened. We'll be okay. It's not my fault. Lynn said Jess was like her little sister. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. None of this is my fault. The priest dies. He didn't have to do anything. You were a child. Nobody could expect anything of you. None of this is my fault. She's gonna be okay. You have her. She'll get to grow up. She'll do everything she was born to do. I was looking around and I actually found a whole bunch of unused voice recordings for Blake. Some of them, or actually a lot of them, just being him spewing more swears, you know, as he does. But also ones that hint him having completely lost his mind. I'm in heaven. I'm going down, down, down into heaven. Everything's fine. It's all fine. I'm coming, Jessica. <laughs> oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. There's a father up above, and he's looking down in love. So be careful, little eyes, what you see. Okay, that did it. Lift me up. I'm going to heaven. <laughs> I would fucking kill myself. Honestly, in my opinion, it would have been pretty cool to hear these in the actual game, because as much as we can tell that he's lost his mind by the final recordings, I feel like these ones really encapsulate it in a much better way. We also only hear it through viewing the recordings in the retail version, so imagine if he suddenly started saying the things which I just showed, 
in regular gameplay. It would be pretty creepy, I'm not gonna lie. Like, can you imagine when he's walking out of the chapel with the baby and he just randomly starts going, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see? That would be nasty. I feel like I quickly need to explain the whole Lin pregnancy thing because that doesn't make a whole lot of sense either. So, how is it that Lin goes through the whole pregnancy cycle in under 24 hours? It all seems very random and unrealistic at first, but this isn't actually the first time that we hear about pregnancy in the timeline. If we go way back to the Outlast DLC, Whistleblower, and have a look at one of the documents called Miscarried Prophets, we hear this. From Jeremy Blair to Richard Traeger. Subject. False Pregnancies slash Real Prophets was reviewing some old test records from the early days of Project Wallrider and something sparked my interest. Were you following the project back in 2010? Apparently we had issues with female employees experiencing psychosomatic pregnancies, something to do with how the morphogenic engine interacts with the immune system. All Greek to me, am I right? It was more often fatal than not, and these were employees, not patients, so a little harder to sweep under the rug, but... The morphogenic engine activity in these ladies' marrow was off the charts, and these are women who were never even exposed to additional hormone therapy. Now, I don't know PPM from a kick in the teeth, but I can read a spreadsheet. And if the projected profits from Project Wallrider are half of what they say they are, I've just got one question. Why aren't we performing experiments on women? God knows mental illness is an equal opportunity affliction, but it seems unethical to pass up on such a potential windfall. Sincerely, Jeremy. Now, as we can hear, the document sort of explains itself. It seems as if the morphogenic engine, aka the machine that Murkoff uses on their subjects, lead to females experiencing these phantom pregnancies, often fatal as it's stated. These women weren't patients either, meaning that they weren't hooked up to the morphogenic engine, like Billy Hope, aka the Wall Rider, or Eddie Gluskin like we see at the start of the DLC. These women were just regular workers, but they still suffered these pregnancy effects, so that's confusing. We often see and hear static when it's related to the morphogenic engine, so that could mean that it travels through waves. Dare I say, microwave frequencies? Or radio tower waves? One would assume that the effects seen in Mount Massive would carry over to whatever they were doing in Temple Gate. This would also explain how so many of the women in Temple Gate, including Lin, got pregnant and die after like we see in the game's final act so how can blake see the baby and lynn can't um lynn spent the majority of the game underground so the radio frequencies didn't scramble her brain as much as blake's uh, i don't know about this one that's my best bet on that now we've gone through pretty much everything except for one of the most crucial parts of the story why is it that Blake is haunted by his childhood friend Jessica's death so many years later? Throughout the game, the player is fed bits of clues or hints as to what happened to Jessica, primarily hinting at the fact that she presumably took her own life, further established by the states she's depicted in through Blake's hallucinations, drawings seen in the school sections, and of course, the hangman's game. As horrible as that already sounds, it's unfortunately not entirely accurate, merely a product of Blake's imagination and what he's been conditioned to think happened. To find out the truth of Jessica's demise, we travel back to the school once again through Blake, but unlike past instances, where it's been a warped and twisted setting, this time it appears more like a flashback and set in reality. Supported by the fact that we are now viewing the world through a young Blake, rather than the usual adult version, possibly strengthening the fact that, at this point, Blake's mind has almost been completely overtaken by the radio towers, allowing total submission. In the flashback, we see a young Blake and Jessica playing around inside a back room in the school after closing hours. They talk for a while, something about a school drama play where Blake is supposed to kiss Lynn, who also attended the same school as Blake. Jessica teases Blake for not having kissed Lynn yet, as she then proceeds to Bautista bomb him to the ground, it's very obvious that Jessica has some sort of feelings for Blake, but as expressed, it doesn't seem like Blake feels the same way towards her and tells her to get off. 
downplaying her signals and such. This could just be a display of innocence and the purity of childhood, especially since there are heavy themes of Catholicism as well, but I digress. Jessica gets off, not after calling him a pushover, of course. Such a pushover, Blake. And the two of them begin making their way toward the exit. Some hints to Blake's regret about the situation and, you know, the whole thing with Jessica liking Blake is also seen through these hangman games, which we can find throughout the school sections of the game. There's especially this one where it says, Jessica loves Blake. Again, very subtle. And then there's this one where you can make out the words and it says, Not telling is worse than lying. And of course, I'll never let you go. Which seems to be a recurring theme. So, yes. Anyway, the two of them begin making their way toward the exit. As they're walking down one of the corridors, the pair are suddenly interrupted and caught by one of the teachers, you know Father Loudermilch. Oh, sorry, we... What are the two of you doing in here? I'm sorry, Father Loudermilch. Loudermilch seems very reluctant on separating the two, abusing his power as both an adult and as a higher figure in the hierarchy in Catholic terms, telling Blake that he's not in trouble yet, but can be if he continues to disobey. You're not in trouble yet, Blake. You don't want to get in trouble, do you? As Loudermilch wants to get Jessica into one of the classrooms, she pleads Blake to stay and he I follows. Loudermilch then what threatens to call the kids' his parents, the which they get afraid parents. of, obviously. That's like the ultimate power that a teacher can use. Do you want me to call your parents? You're like, no, no, don't do that. He then proceeds to get uncomfortably handsy with Jessica, grabbing her shoulders, slightly caressing her face and such. Nasty. He also continues to use his power as an adult and his own faith in religion to manipulate Blake, lecturing him that feeling shame is evidence that he's done something wrong. Shame is a gift from God to let you know right from wrong. And what you want is very wrong. He finishes. Blake, obviously shook about this whole ordeal, is very eagerly pushed out of the classroom and with the door being shut right in his face. With nothing else to do, he makes his way towards the exit. But just as he's about to leave, he hears Jessica scream for help. Screaming for Loudermilch to leave her alone. We see her running away from Loudermilch, who slowly follows her despite her exclaims. Blake immediately runs after them to the doors leading to a stairwell. When he opens it, he discovers Jessica, beaten and with a broken neck. Loudermilch being at the top of the stairs, telling Blake that he didn't see what had just happened. Blake holds the now dying Jessica in his arms, as the flashback then ends. Now, it is heavily implied that Loudermilch at some point in time, you know, to Jessica, we see this behavior from him multiple times in the game, both in person and in emails and messages, where he always attempts to keep her away from everyone else when the opportunity presents itself to do you know what. Certainly doesn't seem like a one-time thing, sadly. Now, it's not directly confirmed that Loudermilch did do these things, but judging from his behavior in the cutscenes and the various cut voice lines which I will not be showing, it seems pretty clear that the developers had intentionally planned on making the school plot line slash Blake's past way darker and disturbing than what we already see in the retail version. Another thing confirming Loudermilch's intentions is seen through the footage which you can record during the school sections. By replaying these and rewinding them, you can hear a faint voice under the static. I managed to find the actual voice recordings, so it doesn't have that weird static and reverse effect over it. She was so right with possibility, so resilient, smiling and flirting, never even aware of the power she had. You killed her, and I never told the soul. I've kept you a secret, our secret. Thank you, thank you, amen. You took her when I could not. You never told the soul. You let the small sorrow of her suicide wash over the unacceptable tragedy of her murder. You removed the temptation 
beyond what the flesh you made was able to resist. Dear Lord, sweet Jesus, forgive my sins and accept my gratitude. Thank you, God, for killing the child. Here we learn that Lattermilch was borderline obsessed with Jessica, as creepy as that is. But we also hear him praying to God, thanking God for taking her away from him, referencing her death of course, as to not commit any more sinful actions. As we can hear, he has completely disassociated himself from being the culprit of her death. And from there on out, it is also implied that Lattermilch then covered up Jessica's death as a suicide, which is seemingly also what he manipulates Blake into thinking. Blake feels regret and guilt because he never said a word about the event and never stood up for himself. I'm sure that most people know that it's incredibly easy to tell younger kids lies and then make them believe those lies, no matter how absurd they are, and this is something Father Lattermilch took full advantage of. By the game's finale, it actually almost seems as if Blake finally overcame his despairing guilt. Blake slowly begins to realize that it wasn't his fault at all and that he was being manipulated, almost as a sort of redemption after having been forced to confront the events that happened again and again and again. We'll find a grown-up and we'll tell them what happened. We'll be okay. It's not my fault. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. None of this is my fault. You were a child. Nobody could expect anything of you. None of this is my fault. Only to finally succumb to the effects of the radio towers as his mind shatters. And as we hear from Jessica in his final dream state, presumably having gone insane at this point, It was all in vain in the end. If you're sitting there and wondering what actually happened to Blake, we'll have to look at the epilogue of the graphic novel The Murkoff Account, which was released in late 2017. In it, we see the events that happen, both a little before and after Blake passes out. But from another perspective, we see the radio towers suddenly being swarmed by ants, which, if you don't know, is the Wall Rider after escaping from Mount Massive. It manages to knock over the towers and because of this causes an explosion, which is what Blake and the player thought was the sun exploding. Next up, we see a bunch of Murkoff workers around the area of Templegate in hazmat suits, checking all the bodies one by one. Here is also where they manage to find Blake, breathing and alive, but sadly in a catatonic state, with only the white showing in his eyes. And catatonic is being like, he's like, oh, he's like, completely busted. He's then sent off with some of the workers, presumably taken to one of Murkoff's facilities to be experimented on in whatever inhumane ways you can imagine. And here is where the story of Outlast 2 actually ends in the timeline. Outlast 2 was a game that had many things going for it and had many things planned during its development cycle, but was ultimately hindered. You can find a plethora of cut content, unused assets, and interesting concepts that were most likely intended to be in the game but were ultimately scrapped or repurposed. They are an indie game studio after all, consisting of a mere 20 people in total at the time of developing Outlast 2, but it's clear to see that they had a much wider and bigger picture in mind compared to what we received at the end result. Either way, I still think that it's an incredible feat what Red Barrels have managed to accomplish over the years, and I am very much excited, as I'm sure many others also are, to see what they have in store for us further down the line. Hello everyone, if you watched this video all the way through, I just want to say thank you so much for your support and willing to stick around for the whole video. This is my first time trying to make this sort of essay style video format with a structure and scripts and so on, so I hope you enjoyed it. I'm willing to take any sort of criticism, I know my narration isn't the best, Birth of the Antichrist, which apparently seems to reside within every woman that gets- Stop me, I sound so fucking wanted. But anyway, thanks for watching. The underlying plotline of Outlast 2. Be sure to smash that like button, subscribe, or finger, uh, share, comment, upvote, downvote. Yeah. Don't you notice how?